Okay, well that was a pretty, hopefully that was a pretty informative video for you. And the reason we put that together is I want to introduce everyone today and uh, we're going to have a live Q&A question. And for anybody watching this on the web, you can type your questions in. Melissa will then pick them up in the back. But I want to introduce you to the Build Westville team. Now you just heard everybody in that video talk about it. It's the new state prison that we're building. They already, Kevin Orm already talked about it, 4,200 beds, 1.2 billion. But the reason we want people to come up here and talk about it, it's kind of the new method I see for new ways to do construction where you're not picking the lowest dollar bidders, but you're picking the most qualified uh, construction managers, architects, and CMs, and uh, based on qualifications, not price. So with, I'm gonna introduce everybody to come on up. Uh, Evan Hagen from M&H is uh, the owner's rep for the project. He's gonna be the first speaker up here. Um, we have Keith from Granger. I pronounced his last name, but I can't pronounce it. We have Mitch Davidson from F.A. Wilhelm. And we have Paul Okeson from Garmong. And those were the three construction managers and the owner's rep. Then we also have Mike Smith up here from Steel Cell. We have T.J. Rogers from Accurate Door Controls. And we have Tony Vai from Elevatus Architects. I think that takes up the eight spots. All right, so um, we're gonna let Evan Hagen, he was the owner's rep. He worked with the State of Indiana Department of Corrections and the architects and the CM. So I'm gonna let him kick it off, and then after that, anybody, any question you have, either for the manufacturers or the construction manager or the architect, feel free to go ahead and ask, and, and especially if you're looking to build a new facility, and granted, they're not all gonna be $1 billion facilities, but I think the point of this is, if you can make it work for a project as large as 1.2 billion, then certainly you can make it work for county jails on any level or any other state facilities. All right, so I'll let you guys take away. Thanks, thanks, Joe. Um, first of all, I think uh, everybody kind of wondering, where is Westville? Well, Westville is in Northwest Indiana. Um, it's located about an hour and 15 minutes from uh, downtown Chicago. Um, again, so we have a lot of influence from the Chicago market up in that area. Um, we, uh, we started uh, Westville. Um, and I know that Kevin and Joe have been talking about Westville probably for the last 10 years, but the actual starting with uh, uh, design started in the uh, fall of 2021, um, brought on Elevatus Architecture, and then um, in 2022, um, we went out for procurement of uh, a, de a design assist partner in the CMC of uh, Build Westville team, which is Keith group and, and Mitch and, and uh, Paul here and we started that uh, that you know like every project we were trying to figure out the budget and how we we're gonna work the budget um, because you know we were working off of dollars that were established probably in 2017 um, and like uh, I think it was mentioned earlier you know dollar amounts have uh, really risen in the last five to ten years um, and especially after the COVID period, you know, we had, uh, you know, people get out of the industry. We have uh, just shortages everywhere. So we worked as a team together to talk through a lot of these things to figure out how to establish a budget to get this project moving forward. Um, currently, right now, um, the Westville site is about uh, 180 acres. Um, it's being built on the existing um, site where, where we have a, a former state hospital that got turned into corrections. Like a lot of people have heard, it, it, you know, they, they did what they could with the buildings they had. Um, that was a 1950s building. We're now moving, you know, we're trying to move it to just to the south on 180 acres. That was a green space. Um, there's challenges with that, and I'm sure we have questions on it. And then the other thing that uh, happened is we have um, two facilities that will be closing for the state of Indiana. Um, we will close down the Westville facility along with ISP, which is in Michigan City. It's their uh, maximum security facility um, up there. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of a, a general overview of the project. I, I guess we're open for questions yeah, now? Okay. Anybody have any 
have any questions? Can you give an update on the schedule? Oh, yeah. Explain why and how the project was procured with several bid packages for each of the buildings. So I think the, the question I heard was why and how the project was procured with several bid packages for multiple buildings. From a high level perspective, uh, it's a very large project, right? We've got 29 total buildings on this campus, uh, constituting 1.5 million square feet. Uh, that's a lot. So if you think about, we're going to hire one electrician, we're going to hire one plumber. There's not a lot of electricians or plumbers that can do 1.5 million square feet of work uh, with the manpower that we're seeing in the marketplace. So what we did was break down each of these into bite-sized chunks. So it took the individual buildings, broke them down, and we're bidding them out that way. So I think currently uh, we're through what we call GMP-5 on this project. Uh, we've got, I think, about a 1 million square feet under contract, totally procured with subcontractors. I think we've got 84 total subcontractors that we've contracted with. Uh, across this market. Now that uh, is contractors from Wisconsin, Indiana, Illinois, Ohio, Kentucky, all over the place that are coming in to bid this work. So that's the reason that we broke it up was so that we could encourage market participation and engage as many contractors as possible, see as many bids as, as possible, uh, and get the best value overall for the project. Does that answer the question? Yes, it did. All right. Evan, do you want to answer Jared's question then? Yeah. Um, so, like we said, he's bid through five bid packages or GMPs. Um, so, uh, again, design started in 2021. Uh, Build Westville team was brought on in 2022. Um, we went through all the design and, and uh, budget phase. Uh, in 2023, August of 23, is when dirt started turning out on the project. Um, and we're currently now have. Uh, about four or five buildings under construction with uh, um, you know coming out of the ground to to uh, wall panels being set yep and to that point too you know if you think about 1.5 million square feet that's a lot of buildings to design and so you know Elevatus has been a tremendous architect to work with but that's a lot to push through and design so well, bug oh that's nice <laughs> so as we have designed these buildings, we're putting them out. So we still don't have every building designed yet. I think we've still got uh, six buildings left to go, Craig, that we're still working through design. We anticipate being fully designed by August of this year and bought out. Uh, but it, it, we just had to stagger things so we could buy, procure, bid, build, go. I have another question from online. How many design assist packages were there in total? All one. How many design assist packages were there total? Uh, so in this instance, we really had just two, and uh, we called that bid event one alpha. That was the first bid event we hit the street with, and that was for our detention equipment and our security electronics packages. Uh, everything else was competitively bid as part of the Indiana State Statute for Procurement, uh, but those two, because it's a very specialized, very niche industry, and like Joe alluded to earlier in his presentation, uh, there's only a few select companies that can perform a project of this size. Uh, we went out on a qualifications-based RFP and hired the contractors on an RFP basis uh, with uh, their, their fee basis, some unit prices, uh, past performance, their bondability, their bank financial statements, things like that. So there was a whole list of criteria that we evaluated the companies on. I, I want to jump on that, that thought a little bit. Um, I think, you know, seen a lot of information from our partners and manufacturers, suppliers, and you're hearing a lot of alphabet soup. If you're a, a county or a state a potential owner thinking about uh, or being confronted with the, the daunting task of building a, a project similar to this one, or, or maybe even uh, larger or smaller, I, I think it's important to understand, you know, the, the content of, of how these things come together, right? having a sophisticated, knowledgeable owner that can sit down and engage you. The design assist process um, actually has some statutory limitations in Indiana, so we had to be very creative as to how we even got into that uh, effort in the first place. But if, if Kevin Orm and his team at the Department of Correction weren't as involved and collaborative and engaged um, as they were, we probably wouldn't have gotten to that point. And without having that design assist participation, these cost overruns and these price jumps that Keith's referring to would have been greatly exacerbated. I think the opportunity to have their engagement early on, having an owner who's engaged, 
and who participates in the process as well is absolutely critical to getting to a place where you can contain costs and, and deliver things in a, in a timely fashion um, and keeping things on the rails, especially as many GMPs as this project has already <laughs> and will have by the time it's done. A lot of moving parts. And if, if, if I might address that acronym GMP, Guarantee Maximum Price, I think there's a perception that may, if you're just getting familiar with this, is, you know, it's not price-based. Well, the selection of the team is not price-based, but the team then buys in to these guaranteed maximum prices. So, you know, as an owner, don't think it's, it's, it's willy-nilly, whatever. No, actually, you're just bringing in manufacturers and subcontractors and you know, specialty products, and we're all buying in uh, to the pricing structure and you know what's key for us is to deliver the quality and not let overruns creep in uh, and I think Paul Gell does a good job at that of you know we know you want this you know it'd be great to have 10 foot ceilings okay well if you have 10 foot ceilings everywhere then do you realize you add this cost so can we do the same thing with a 9 foot 4 ceiling a 9 foot 6 ceiling so these are the type of discussions that go on. Uh, you know, what's, what may not be evident, but is the best manufacturing way to get something done. Those conversations come in all with that goal of beating, and not just meeting, but beating that guaranteed maximum price. It's been discussed and, you know, the poly team and this team has worked together. Uh, you know, we've been a part of, Steel Cell has been a part of nearly 300 projects now. It's nice to see this level all the way up to the owner looking at, okay, how do we get the most for that, you know, uh, decided upon dollar. They've appropriated money. It's not a limitless basket. There's a certain amount, and, and that gets us, this type of collaboration gets us there. I want to jump on that one too, Mike. Um, we, when we started the project, we, we didn't have the funds that we currently have. Um, Working with the team, we came in with uh, understanding of uh, the state legislative had, had given a, a, a dollar amount um, or appropriated a dollar amount. Um, when we got working through it, I think the first thing was to establish what the correct budget is in, in 2024 time. Um, so that was the very first initial thing the team did along with Poly Jail and Steel Cell was come up with the, the budget for this project. I think that was one of our biggest accomplishments, getting that passed through the state of Indiana. Yeah. I think you should tell them. So, uh, and Joe, how many years ago did we sit down and start talking about approaching this project? This, this project in particular? Yeah. Well, I, start, I started working on this with Kevin about 14 years yeah. ago. So, yeah. In, but we sat down about, well, first this job was going to be design-build. So we actually put right. together a design-build team right. before they switched it to see them at risk, right? So I think, you know, when the RFP came out, and I can say this because it's a matter of public record, the, the budget in the RFP was $375 million. And that was a 2018 estimate that was probably 50% light in 2018. Right? And if you fast forward now to where we are today and you see $1.2 billion, um, to, to their point, we actually got uh, awarded the project and started on it before we had all the funding in place uh, it took a lot of effort from the Department of Correction team uh, under Kevin's leadership uh, and former DOC commissioner who's here, I think, Rob Carter. Um, you know, that, those conversations are lengthy and it's an arduous process to engage the General Assembly to get the remainder of the funding. Um, it's just a Herculean effort, but in an essence, what we found ourselves doing was building the plane while it was in the air, right? So they're still getting the rest of the money and we're started on this design process um, and it's just, you know, if, if, you're, if you don't have the level of coordination within your community at all levels of, of uh, the political structure, these things become infinitely harder. This is taxpayer money. I will say that the state of Indiana um, is paying this in all cash. So $1.2 billion in all cash proceeds. There's no bonding or financing for the project. And to get that level of coordination from the General Assembly through the governor's office into the Department of Correction, all the way down into the vendors ultimately entrusted to build the project 
is pretty important because we've done 26 jails in Indiana alone since 2014. And inside a county, it's difficult at times to get the sheriff and the commissioners and the council and, it, and the judges all on the same page to even get, you know, a $20 million project done. So when you think about the enormity of a $1.2 billion project, if you're thinking about going down this road and you're endeavoring to build a new facility, you had better get collaboration, engagement at all levels of your political process or uh, good luck getting it done. One of the things I'd like to point out is uh, being a part of the design assist program, we had the opportunity to not only work with the architects, engineers, um, the builders, but also the owners to learn what they really wanted this facility to operate. And throughout the last year and a half, almost two years of development, there's been a lot of things that have changed in their, in their logic of operations. And as we've gone through that process, we've been able to, to change the technology and change how the mechanical components work that, you know, that move people in and out of these uh, areas within this building, you know, the security level. We also were able to talk to the, uh, Dr. DeWinger about functionality uh, inside mental health units to that, that frankly weren't available in the industry. So we were able to then in turn go to our manufacturers and say, we would really like this function that doesn't exist. And they came back and said, well, we can make that function happen for them. And that's an innovation that we're bringing to the industry. I'll talk about that later today, but that's some of the thing that uh, the de design assist collaboration brings to projects that don't happen in other delivery methods. In addition to that, one of the things we implemented is the modular control system. Um, on the electrical package, Keith, you know, we, we saved um, about $7 million on the electrical package by implementing uh, factory installed security electronics, you know, associated with Mike Cell. So those are some of the things that the design assist collaboration brings to projects that aren't available any other way. Do we have any questions from the people here in the audience? Les Johnson, architect from the Bahamas. Um, I'd like to know uh, what are some of the um, specialty areas you think the design assist um, coordination uh, should happen in, and at what point during the design process you think this should occur, right at the beginning with the architect or once he would have conceptualized? You know, what point do you think we should bring in that specialty? What? <laughs> I would say as, as, as soon as you can. Um, from an architect's perspective, um, and if there's anybody out there considering uh, designing and constructing a new justice facility, um, please promise me you'll find an architect that specializes in this. You're not, you're, you're not designing um, a movie theater or a church or a school or a hospital, right? If you were, you'd go find a specialist. Um, these are very specialized buildings. Uh, you, you need to hire an architect that specializes that. Now, I will tell you, and there's other architects in the room. Um, this gentleman is just one, Craig and I are, are another, and there, there's others that, uh, you know, we're, we're very good at what we do. But architects have to know um, a little bit about, uh, about a lot, okay? When, when you go with the design assist model, we have at our disposal, at the design table with us, um, the details. We can get through the design um, we, we know the components, we know the, the, uh, the bag of parts that we're going to detail around um, at the time that, that, that we design them. Now, without the design assist, we might have a basis of design. You, you may have heard that term um, that we go through, but when we know what we're going to get, and if we have an owner that says, hey, I'd like a light in my mental health cell that can change the circadian rhythm, I just call TJ, can we do that? He said, yeah, we could do it. I didn't know we could do that, but he said, yeah, no problem. We, we get through that, that, uh, that um, you know, that design uh, question quickly. Um, I think in terms of timing, to, to, to get back to really your question, I would say as, as, as soon as you can. I mean, I, you can get through a schematic design, for instance, quickly. But um, let's, let, let's start at the, at the very beginning of schematic dot design. Um, and, and Craig can talk more about this uh, if you'd like to, because he, he was really responsible for a lot of the design at, at Westville. When you have a housing unit that's going to have 1,700 beds in it, 
um, you don't design a building and then call Mike Smith and say, Mike, stuff your cells in there. That, that, that's not an, uh, an efficient approach. You call M Mike Smith and say, Mike, what's, a, what's an efficient cell? Let's start with your module. Let's stack those up as, as efficiently as we can and then design the building around that. So to have that answer at your disposal early in schematic design, I, I, I think is a win for, for the whole team. Just, I'd add on to that too, Tony, and I think it's important to understand this. And again, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to put myself in the, in the, in the chair of an owner uh, or a user as a, as a sheriff or a jail commander, uh, and you think about, you know, taking on a project like this, I, I can speak for myself, but we've worked with every one of these companies on multiple occasions before. This is not our first dance. In fact, every jail that we've built has a steel cell box in it. It has a Titan steel door on it. It has um, the locking systems. It has often accurate controls. It has Willoughby products in it. I mean, we've all, and all these companies, we've all worked together before, right? Can you imagine taking on a $1.2 billion pr project with a group of people who have never even met each other before because they had the best number on a piece of paper, right? I, I mean, th this is a challenging process. You can imagine, even if you've never even done something like this, the amount of moving parts that are involved. So when Joe talks about pre-qualifications and, and the sense of team, there's really no way to, to value how much the familiarity inures to the benefit of the owner. But there's one way to find out, and that's just pick the guy with the best number on a piece of paper who's never done it before and put him in a room with another person he's never met who had the best number on a piece of paper and they've never worked before. You, you'll find out real quick how bad it can get. Yeah, I understand. I'm just adding on to the sense of, of you know, when you take on this project, right, the familiarity is important and that design assist process becomes so much more effective because when when they zig, we know when to zag. Um, and that's just a, that, that chemistry is, is hard to quantify, but it is critically important. And I, you know, I, I wouldn't have done this working with people I'd never worked with before. No way. You know, we did, we did have some constraints, you know, so our first package that we put out was the two design assist proposals. So that was the earliest we could put them out for, for the project and it was kind of constrained by the funding mechanism for the project, uh, but we got them in as early as possible. But I think one one aspect that's not really, you know, we're talking price, price and, and cost. I, as a CM, I, I look at it as more as budget stability more than it is about cost is that, you know, with the CMC method, we come up with a guaranteed maximum price, so we're at risk at that. That's the that's the difference. So, the you know the pricing is going going to fluctuate mainly from a scope standpoint. But but what we're important we we care about more is in terms of you know not not having to deal with escalation and um, market changes and whatnot. The, this team is very good at keeping the budget stable and taking that risk off of our plate. And thinking five years down the road. And thinking five years down the road. So, um, but another aspect of the design assist is the time aspect of it. So if you think the traditional method of plan and spec, bid, um, you know, you as the architect are meeting with the client kind of by yourself without any of these experts up here, you're doing your best guess of what the industry is at that time, looking through catalogs and going through that putting out your CDs, we bid them out, and then now the re design revisions happen because there's new technology, new, new ways or, or, uh, or layouts um, to, to do that. And then you have to revise it, then the pricing changes and whatnot, and then the submittals don't even start till later. Our, our method here is we, we literally have steel cells being fabricated right now before CDs even Uh, yeah, it must be me. So we have uh, steel cells, as we said, um, being fabricated before the first foundation went in for, for our, our sets of buildings. So the time aspect, and it's, it, it's a bit, it has to be more efficient for Elevatus to design around something that's rather than uh, waiting for submittals and having to tweak their design. So there's so much more efficiency in that, and overall it's going to help the overall schedule for the project.
Do we have any other questions from the audience or from anybody on the web? Melissa, you got one? So I just got another question, just so we can be clear. Who are the SEC and DECs for this project and any comments on how they were selected? I think the question was, who are the SECs and the DECs for this project? Yes. Okay. And how, how are they selected? Yes. Okay, yeah. So we went through an RFP process, like I said, uh, bit event 1 alpha, 1A. Uh, back in April of last year, I believe, April of 23. Um, and so we put that out, and it was a qualifications-based RFP uh, where the DEC, the Detention Equipment Contractor, and the Security Electronics Contractor, SEC, had to propose on that and provide us with a list of past projects, their organizational chart, uh, their anticipated project staffing, their trade partners, um, bonding letters from their bonding company, a whole variety of items that we use in the evaluation. So on this project, we selected uh, the Poly Jail Building Company, and Accurate Control. So Poly Jail is serving as our DEC, and Accurate Controls is serving as our SEC contractor. Uh, so those are the two that we had selected. Now what we did, once we received those, we actually had a scorecard, a scoring matrix that we as the ownership group and the CM and the architect went through and evaluated. So we assigned one person from each member of our team, so one from Department of Corrections, one from the Department of Administration, the owner's rep, the CM, Bill Westville, and the architect, and we independently evaluated and assigned a score value of one to 10 for these different categories. And then we got our scorecards together, averaged them out, and that's how we made the selection. So independently scored by each party uh, so that there could be no, uh, no collusion or anything like that, evaluated it and made the award based on that. So there was a fee that they proposed on for their pre-construction or the design assist services as a part of that. And then they stipulated their fee percentage for the total cost of construction. Uh, so it wasn't like in the true rip and read or hard bid format where you tear the, tear the envelope open and you read a number and you say, for $4 million, bingo, right? That's, that's not how this was evaluated. Do we have any other questions from the audience? Yes, Mr. Goldberg. Experts, great. I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit. We're uh, municipal advisors as well as architects. And our fear for several years has been that the escalating cost for these complex buildings would start bumping up against communities' capacity to, to, to raise, pass taxes to make their payments. What do you all see in the future, the next few years, in terms of cost escalation is it going to slow down or are we going to see any kind of leveling off what would you uh, suggest to owners who dilly dally and think that it's it's business as usual um, how would you advise them that's a that's a good question. I think probably the first answer is if I knew what the market was going to do, I'd be working on Wall Street and not sitting up here. <laughs> um, but I think, you know, when we evaluated the project from Bill Westville's perspective, we knew that we started off with a budget that was much lighter than what the cost of construction would be. We knew that the project was not going to start for probably a year, 18 months. Uh, we were awarded in April of 22. Uh, and like Evan said, you know, we, we put the first shovel in the ground in August of 23. Uh, so what we did is we evaluated and put together our budgets. We carried uh, several, um, several integers on top of the actual cost of construction numbers. We had a market volatility uh, integer that we put on there. We had you know the owner's contingency, we had escalation costs. So we tried to pre-plan and think against, okay, we know what the value, we, don't, we know it's a square foot of roofing costs if I buy it off the shelf today. What's it gonna cost in two years, in three years, in four years? And so we try to prevent against that uh, by using these escalation, these escalation numbers uh, in our budget. And so far, I, you know, I'll say I think we're $950 million under contract uh, through bidding, through all these bid events. Uh, and so far, we're, we're seeing that we're only about a touch under 1% over $950 million. So the percentages that we carried uh, have obviously worked out in this instance and are holding true. But from a manufacturer standpoint, um, you know, we use all the tools at our disposal, and there are many of them, but 
uh, steel prices. I mean, obviously, a lot of what we're doing is steel. Uh, it goes into a lot of the components that we buy. And look, that's, that's, that's a weekly conversation. Uh, you know, we're asking uh, what futures look like, um, when is the best time to buy, or we're trying to predict the best time to buy. I will say this on materials. Uh, we feel like it's, it had a post-COVID jump. Uh, a lot of that was due to high demand and low employment during COVID. That has trended back to something a little more predictable and normal. But I think the other post-COVID thing that's going on right now is everything has hit the consumer. You know, I was shocked the other day talking to a guy and I'm, you know, he's going to McDonald's and McDonald's, you know, is 12 bucks now. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's, w everything has trickled down. It's trickled down to where our employees are shopping at Walmart, you know, they're shopping for the best price, but all those prices are up. So really, I think the next thing, or the thing that we're dealing with now and hoping that we see level out is escalating uh, employment costs. It just costs more per hour um, um, to get things done. Uh, the employees demand it. Um, coming off COVID, everybody had three different opportunities for jobs. Uh, everybody was looking for work. I don't know. It was, looks like 12 million people or something died during COVID because we were all the employees for a while. So that's starting to be a little more predictable now. Uh, so I think we're back into an area where we can look at some normal inflation, but the buildup over the last three years has been pretty substantial. It, it, I, Larry, I think your, your point that, you, that you're making is spot on, right? If you wait and delay, I don't think it's a matter of whether, it's never going to be less expensive to build than it is in this very moment, right? Tomorrow it's going to cost more than it did today. It's just a matter, of, to Mike's point, of how much. You know, is the rate of increase going to come down a little bit, or is it going to stay on this track that it's on? I'll give you a, a quick example, um, and, and Eric back in the room can attest to this, but exact same design jail, 150,000 square feet, same number of beds, same number of cells. 2018, that jail cost $53 million. Today, it priced out at $92 million. Exact same stuff. I mean, almost no changes in the design. So you think about what, you know, six months and a year can do, and sometimes it can't be helped, right? I mean, you got elections and things that interrupt the process, but a delay is certainly going to cost you more money. I kind of pile on there, Paul, um, and, and you talked about what, what do you say to the county that wants to be willy nally a little bit, I think is the word he used. So we, we $1.2 billion, 4,200 bed projects to work on. Um, but at, at Elevatus, and I'm sure the other designers uh, in the room, a common, very common uh, that we're from 150 beds to 250. Dissected the numbers, and, and, and this is information isn't that old. <clears throat> For jails about that size, that's somewhere in the 30 to 40, 40 million dollar range, um, every month you procrastinate that project, it's going to cost you about a hundred thousand dollars. Every month costs you a hundred thousand dollars. That's some real, some, some real numbers uh, that you can think about um, to, to, to try to push through. So when uh, when a county wants to push a decision uh, to the next commissioner's meeting, um, do that a couple times and you just cost your, your taxpayers some significant money. Do we have any other questions from the audience? Okay, we have one all the way over here. Hi, I'm Mary Alford, Alachua County. Um, I have a question about open source uh, building automation protocols versus um, proprietary systems. Uh, when we use uh, proprietary smart buildings, right? So jails are probably the epitome of a smart building. And so when we use proprietary operating systems that are only designed to u work with certain vendors, then that limits our ability to uh, have systems work with each other or for them to be upgraded. We're kind of held hostage by that vendor's software and when they decide to update and how much they decide to charge for that. So can you talk a little bit about the role of uh, open source building automation systems in, in your design? Thank you. I'm going to take this real quick and then I'll pass the time over to you. That's, 
you're spot on. You couldn't have said it any better. Um, the subscription-based model or the proprietary software uh, sounds really good on the front end until the bill shows up 12 months after completion, right? Or you're locked in and you're stuck. So part of our evaluation criteria when we go design assist for the security electronics is that we mandate that it be an open source, non-proprietary, non-subscription-based system. And part of the evaluation is looking at what is that system, how is it used, what has it been used, where has it been used, uh, how much did it cost, how do they service it after the warranty period, what does that look like? And so that's a big part of our evaluation criteria is so that we don't lock in and we don't lock the client into something that they're stuck with uh, you know, in perpetuity. And so I'll turn it over to TJ because that's, this is his baby. Thank you, that's a great question and, and one that we see virtually every project and owner have a problem with. Uh, Accurate Controls started by promoting a non-proprietary approach to building security automation systems. And we've been talking about it ad nauseum for my career, which is about 35 years. And as a buyer, as an owner, you can get systems across the board that are non-proprietary and won't cost a lot of money to service and, and, and support through software maintenance agreements if, you're, if you understand what to avoid and how to situate the project. One of the things, I'm gonna go back to the Build Westville team, we had lots of discussions with the owners, the design team, and the builders about what constitutes a proprietary system, proprietary software, and how to avoid it. And we outlined all the various options and talked about how we can train their staff and their IT department to maintain it. So it's avoidable, again, going back to the design assist partnership, picking the right companies and people with the right references and history to support that need is important because we get calls on a weekly basis from facilities that we didn't do that are in a situation that they can't get out of. And it's, it, it's really disheartening. Um, so thank you for the question. Does that answer your question? Well, TJ, I think there's a prime example. Um, we could talk about, I won't go with the names of the county, but there are a couple of county jails, an example, in Georgia, where pretty large projects, probably a couple hundred, three or four hundred million dollars, and they went with a low price door control company will go unnamed, but what we came to find out afterwards was first of all, their door controls didn't really function the way they were supposed to, and then we caught up to the county was having to pay that company $640,000 a year just to maintain their control systems that they paid for. And people, th people act like that doesn't happen a lot. Well, what happens is once you finish up the job and you leave and you go home, whether the electrical general or the architect, what you don't know is what the owner then finds out. He gets a proprietary door control system, which means you can't do anything to it unless he comes to service it. Once, the, once day one, after 365 days, for the one-year warranty is up, you now get what's called a service contract. And if you don't sign the service contract and pay for the service contract, you get no service. And I think that's one of the worst things that happens in this industry, and it happens to a lot of different counties, because what happens, I don't know if the architects and CMs didn't do their due diligence and realize what a proprietary system is versus non-proprietary, but that's one of the biggest issues that we see on a regular basis in jails and prisons. So do we have any more questions? We have one more in the back. Go ahead, Melissa. I've got one more from online, and this is the last one I have. Can the panel talk about what specific design and construction elements of the Westville facility are being implemented to address mental health issues within the inmate population? Well, I, I, I'll tell you what, the, the, the best thing that we did as designers is we listened to our owner, um, Dr. Dwinger, who's not here today. Uh, she was in every design meeting and uh, there are architects that will tell you uh, they are mental health experts. Um, the real experts are the doctors and the people and, and the people that are helping the people that need help. You listen to them and you're gonna design a fantastic facility. 
Um, some of the things um, uh, TJ kind of touched on uh, in the video was giving them control, just a little bit of control, right? They can't let themselves out of the cell, but you know what? They can dim their lights. They can change um, the, the, the white noises and the musics in their cell. We, uh, when we, we had a design meeting with uh, Dr. Dwenger, um, we had talked about the circadian rhythm. The, the, the design concept in really the circadian rhythm is to change the temperature of the light to mimic natural sunlight. And Dr. Dwenger says, says can we just give the, 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 uh, uh, the patients that control? And I'm like, well, doc, you, that, that, that's not what it's meant to do. And she goes, I know, I know. But can we do it? And I said, TJ, can we do it? And he said, yeah, we can do that. Um, so I, 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 probably the best thing you can do is, is listen to the folks that are out running and operating um, and, uh, and, and begin with that. individual cells along with uh, um, chalkboards that will be installed. I'll take that one. That's fine. Yeah, that's um, so, I mean, obviously natural light, right? We got to think, yes, these are incarcerated individuals, but they're human beings that just made a bad choice. And one of the things that we as design professionals and, and mental health you know, experts are trying to change the culture, or change the mentality of don't look at these individuals as incarcerated people. Yes, they did something bad, but most of them are gonna reintegrate into society. And we wanna keep making sure that we remind them that there is a good thing out there. You know, skylights, natural lighting, these are all things that, um, I, I don't wanna say it gives them hope, but it keeps them in touch with what's going on in the world. And that's important that they know what's going on because they're gonna to have to be in it again at some point. Um, you know, doing my, one of my very first mental health facilities was in North Carolina uh, about 17 years ago. And what we did there isn't anywhere close to what we were talking about in the conversations that we're doing today in the Westville Correctional Facility. And we're still learning from those professionals. And, you know, again, it's, it's one of those things to where we got to enhance the environment to promote their understanding that and give them programs to get back into society because that's where they're going to end up um, and we want to you know live with these individuals um, they're good people they just made a bad choice and the you know, materials the things that we're doing make it a little more residential in nature um, these are all good things that I feel that you know as the design team up here we're really starting to take that approach and change the perception of what an incarcerated individual is with a mental health condition Well, real quick, another item that, uh, you know, the owner is purchasing um, more of the uh, Norex uh, slash Cortec uh, type of furniture for these for these cells as well. Um, and that we're, we're also talking about, the, you know, um, chalkboards in, in their rooms that have the ability to, to write down, just maybe even give them a list of uh, what they need to do for the day on the board. Um, but there's also challenges with that because I work with the owner and, and you know, I'm talking with um, um, the correctional officers and they have heartburn when, when you go see those kind of things being put into a, into a, a cell. And so for us to you know, walk through how that's gonna be secured onto the walls and how it's not gonna be turning into a weapon. Dr. Goodman. Thank you, Joe, for that uh, promotion. Uh, Charlie Goodman, architect from uh, Dallas, Texas, um, used to work for El Avadis. box uh, in there uh, 23 hours a day and uh, really have no idea what time of day it is so the question on your system is can we create it so that it actually follows what's happening 
with lighting in the cell is actually happening outside so that, that it can ebb and flow have some sense of what's up and what's down? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, thank you. Um, so the question is, can, can we do a time of day uh, transition of light, uh, morning being brighter through the afternoon and then, you know, following the sunrise and sunset? And the answer is yes. And so, uh, you know, th interestingly enough, this was a collaboration when we were asked, to, you know, could, could this be done? And I want to go back to the Design Assist Partnership. We don't build the light fixture. Uh, Kennel, um, Frank is here. We, Steel Cell Poly Jail and Kennel talked about it. And they had a light fixture that would do this for, for health care, but not for corrections. And the first time we talked to Frank, he said, well, yeah, buyers don't really want that because of the price. Well, could you do it? I think they would want it if we did it. And so it was, it, we worked together to bring this to the market. I don't sell light fixtures. We control them. But we can pr absolutely provide that functionality um, to provide a better environment. And um, it, it works, and, and it brings people... Um, you know, a better environment in those situations. So we can do it. So thank you.